Excellencies, Madam Executive Secretary, distinguished delegates, the meeting is called to order. We will now consider agenda item four, review of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in Asia and the Pacific and issues pertinent to the subsidiary structure of the Commission. The documents pertinent to this item are SCAP 77 5 entitled Report of the Governing Council of the Special Program for the Economies of Central Asia on its 15th session. SCAP 77 6 entitled Summary of Progress in the Implementation of Commission Resolutions. SCAP 77 7 entitled Summary of the Meetings of the Subsidiary Bodies of the Commission held in the period 2020 to 2021. SCAP 77-INF-1 on annual reports of international and intergovernmental organisations provided to the Commission. First, we, we begin with a presentation by the Secretariat covering the work of the Secretariat since the Commission last met in May 2020. It is my pleasure to invite the Deputy Executive Secretary, Mr. Kave Zahidi, to deliver his presentation. Mr. Sahidi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Your, Your Excellency. Uh, I have the pleasure of presenting uh, highlights of, uh, of work from across the substantive divisions of the SCAP Secretariat in support of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development here in Asia and the Pacific. The starting point for the presentation is SDG progress, something that was the focus of the eighth Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development last month. The SDG progress report showed us that the Asia-Pacific region has made strong progress on a few areas, including health and well-being, which is goal three, something that of course provided and proved and is proving invaluable in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. But it also highlighted that progress has been too slow on half of the goals and regressing in critical ones such as climate action and life below water. What we learned from discussions at the APFSD is that while the region was already not on track to achieve the 17 goals by 2030, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly further undermined progress. It has also brought into sharp focus where a change in direction may be needed most. First and foremost, among the areas where a change in direction is needed is social protection. Investment in social protection in Asia Pacific is less than half of the global average, as the slide shows. The underinvestment has left millions of people unprotected and vulnerable to the pandemic. To close this gap, the recently adopted action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific has provided a clear course of action, and we are working with the UN development system at the regional and national levels to support countries to implement this action plan. If we're successful, our simulation, and this is the previous slide, shows that higher investments such as universal co coverage of child benefits disability benefits and old age pensions could decrease the proportion of households living in poverty by up to 18%. The pandemic has also highlighted again the fundamental value and role of the environment. COVID-19 as a zoonotic disease can be traced back to the unhindered destruction and fragmentation of ecosystems. Recovery from the pandemic means helping our region with what the UN Secretary General described as making peace with nature. To raise climate ambitions, for example, we joined forces with our partners to support countries develop COVID-19 recovery strategies in line with the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement. At the city level, where COVID-19 impacts and rapid urbanization intersect, we are working with local governments and stakeholders to shape policy pathways for COVID-19 recovery. And a new initiative is also underway to help cities address plastic waste pollution, an issue that, of course, has been accentuated by the pandemic. A key part of raising climate ambitions depend, depends on the region's energy transition towards green, clean, and renewable energy. 
There is a clear economic case for investing in renewable energy that is now often the cheapest option. But as the graph shows, renewables also offer greater resilience to shocks than a fossil fuel dominant energy sector. For example, renewable energy sector is less reliant on a supply chain of energy inputs and less prone to reduction in energy demands. Accelerating the energy transition, strengthening energy security, and building the resilience of the energy system to shocks go hand in hand. To this end, the Secretariat is supporting countries to develop scenarios for their energy transition, including roadmaps for SDG 7 that are completed in Georgia and Indonesia and under development in Fiji, Lao PDR, Tonga, and Vietnam. We are also working with countries to implement the regional roadmap on power system connectivity. Moving to disaster risk response and resilience building, many countries in our region had to cope with dual crises of COVID-19 and severe climate-induced disasters over the past year. Like COVID, while impacts of disasters are long-lasting, they are often disproportionately borne by low-income communities and countries. Holistic disaster reduction measures will therefore be crucial for protecting people and protecting their hard-won development progress from future crises. In response to all of this, the Secretariat is working, including at the sub-regional level, to increase the understanding of the expanding risk scape that includes slow onset disasters such as droughts, as well as biological disasters such as COVID. For example, we're supporting ASEAN to develop a concrete action plan for managing droughts that are becoming more frequent and more intense and helping integrate disaster responsiveness in national social protection systems in the Pacific. We are also developing practical tools to support countries build resilience, for example, using geospatial data in disaster risk reduction and to improve impact-based forecasting in early warning systems. On transport, the pandemic also highlighted the region's connectivity strengths and weaknesses. The containment measures during the COVID-19 pandemic affected all segments of freight and passenger transport and highlighted the need for a coordinated region-wide response to sustain such freight flows. All of this has shaped our work over the year. For example, with our support, the guideline for resilient and sustainable international road freight transport connectivity in ASEAN was developed and subsequently endorsed and can help guide recovery actions within that sub-region. We are also continuing work on the priorities of safe and inclusive transport and sustainable transport, including through the Asia-Pacific Road Safety Observatory and national capacity building initiatives on adopting smart transport technologies. As the, as the previous slide showed, <laughs> maybe we can go back to it. As the previous slide showed, building Resilience and sustainability is central to the next phase of the Regional Action Program for Sustainable Connectivity 2022 to 2026 that is under development with the guidance of the Committee on Transport. On trade and investment, obviously keeping to the connectivity challenge, trade and investment, once key engines of regional growth, are clearly stalling. Although international trade in goods started to recover in the second half of 2020, the recovery has been uneven across countries. Major uncertainties remain for 2021, especially in terms of trade in services such as tourism, so vital for so many of the economies of our region. In response, ESCAP's framework agreement on facilitation of cross-border paperless trade has now entered into force with the potential to support more seamless and efficient trade. Model provisions and trade agreements have also been developed with UN partners and can strengthen the capacity to cope with disruptions in times of crisis. And our support to micro, small and medium enterprises that are the backbone of the region's economies will be vital for economic recovery. In this context, we have supported MSMEs led by women through the development of fintech solutions and gender lens investing initiatives. COVID has put the spotlight on an increasingly digital world where trade, services, and support are increasingly based 
on digital access and digital literacy. But a prerequisite is bridging the digital divide. With the support of the committee, the Asia-Pacific Information Superhighway Initiative is entering its second phase of implementation with accelerated actions to turn the digital divide into a digital dividend. Through the Asia-Pacific Plan of Action on Space Applications for Sustainable Development, capacity is being strengthened to use geospatial data to respond to issues such as drought, flood, air pollution, water pollution, and even the COVID-19 pandemic. We are working with partners to put in place national inclusive technology and innovation policies, including in Cambodia, Myanmar, Mongolia, Philippines, and elsewhere. The pandemic has also underlined the importance of data for rapid science-based decision-making. This is why ESCAP continues to prioritize support to countries in strengthening national statistical systems to deliver trusted and disaggregated data. With support from the UN system, countries have filled data gaps and data avail availability for monitoring SDG progress has doubled since 2017. Yet, a third of the indicators are still without any data. So there is much work to be done. Our data and statistics programs, like all other work across the Secretariat, have been adapted to a virtual setting due to the pandemic. We have achieved, as a result, record participation in web-based trainings and in the new Asia-Pacific Stats Cafe series, a way of maintaining uh, our connection with our primary stakeholders at the country level. Now looking forward, looking forward, our survey for 2021 underlines that the challenge ahead is to confront the deep and sometimes permanent impacts from crises by ensuring sustained economic recovery from COVID-19, while at the same time pursuing inclusive and sustainable development. This will be possible through measures enhancing the policy and fiscal space and aligning public and private investments with the 2030 agenda. To this end, we have developed a model that analyzes a build forward better policy package for resilient, inclusive and sustainable post COVID-19 economies and options for confronting rising debt and meeting financing needs, such as through bond issuance and climate finance instruments. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Excellencies, regional cooperation, which has been the underlying part of the conversation throughout this commission, is going to be pivotal as the region navigates the development of pathways to address COVID-19 recovery and accelerate the implementation of the sustainable development goals, something that remains off track within our region. The work of the Commission provides a solid base for this, as the analysis, frameworks, roadmaps and tools contained in the documents before you show. I've only presented really a glimpse of all the work that is undertaken by your Secretariat, uh, with much more contained in the Commission document that is available to you. We very much look forward to the deliberation of the Commission to further fine-tune our support to Member States in achieving their sustainable, sustainable development plans and ambitions. Thank you very much, and back to you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Zahidi. The Commission shall now hear from the Chairs of the subsidiary bodies of ESCAP that met in between sessions to brief us on the outcomes of those intergovernmental meetings. We shall begin with the Chair of the 8th Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, Her Excellency Ms. Merisani Wakolo Rakuita, Minister of Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation from Fiji, who has recorded her statement. May I invite the conference room officer to play her video, please. Distinguished delegates of the 77th session of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Last month, I had the pleasure of chairing the 8th Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, held on the theme Sustainable and Resilient Recovery from the COVID-19 Pandemic in Asia and the Pacific. It is my honor to address you today to briefly share some of the highlights of the 8th APFSD and briefly inform this forum of the outcomes of the meeting. During the forum, 
member states of ESCAP, intergovernmental bodies, UN bodies, specialized agencies, and other stakeholders discuss regional perspectives on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in Asia and the Pacific. The forum noted that the COVID-19 pandemic was a developmental, environmental, human rights, and security concern, and it called attention to its devastating socio-economic impacts across the region and the resulting diminished prospects for achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It noted that the disruptions of COVID-19 had revealed and exacerbated regional and national inequalities and vulnerabilities that had long exposed member states and their societies to economic and other shocks. Recovery measures in place include stimulus packages, programs to improve living standards based on a people-first principles and people-centered development, green recovery strategies, support to health and education sectors, various provisions to ease financial burdens, skilling people for income, and free vaccines for the most vulnerable. The forum reviewed regional progress on the sustainable development goals by going through summary reports of nine parallel roundtables for an in-depth assessment of the relevant goals, taking note of proposed strategies which are detailed in the reports. The role of international solidarity in the COVID-19 response, including through regional and inter-sub-regional cooperation, was pointed as a way forward. The forum also emphasized that despite the challenges of the pandemic, commitment to achieving the SDGs and implementation efforts continued and advanced. Consideration of gender and human rights and for our collective voices to be heard in the process of regional discussions and reporting on women and youth empowerment was the call of many delegations. Members were appreciative to the United Nations Development Systems Actions to assess and support the achievement of the 2030 Agenda despite COVID-19 setbacks. Strengthening follow-up and review to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was also recognized, citing voluntary national reviews as a sure way of ensuring collaborations across sectors, inclusion and innovation. It is my hope that the Commission will consider the outcomes of the 8th APFSD in their upcoming deliberations, taking ownership of our strategies to move forward as a region. I wish you well. Thank you. Next, may I invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the third session of the Committee on Information and Communications Technology, Science, Technology and Innovation, his Excellency Dr. Renato Junior Salidum, Under Secretary for Scientific and Technical Services, Department of Science and Technology of the Philippines. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it was my honor together with distinguished vice chairs from Indonesia, Pakistan, Azerbaijan, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and Samoa to be elected as chair of the third session of the Committee on Information and Communications Technology, Science, Technology, and Innovation on 19 August 2020. 38 member states with a total of 280 participants and observers attended. I am pleased to summarize four key outcomes of the committee as follows. First, on accelerating regional cooperation, the committee recognized that COVID-19 has further demonstrated the importance of digital connectivity and e-resilience and recommended that the Secretariat support expanding regional collaboration to scale up broadband internet capacities for the effective use of technological innovation. It recognized with concern that the digital divide is widening in the region and called for the active participation of governments, the private sector, and other relevant stakeholders to bridge the digital divide. It is also recommended to expand investments in next generation infrastructure, networks, and the need to accelerate research on co-deployment of fiber optic cables along passive infrastructure networks and the establishment of carrier neutral internet exchange points for proving quality and cost of internet connectivity. Second, on the Asia Pacific Information Superhighway Initiative, the committee recommended that the Secretariat set up a drafting group as part of the Asia Pacific Information Superhighway Steering Committee to develop an action plan 
for the next phase of implementation of the APIS Master Plan for 2022 to 2026 for consideration and adoption by the committee at its fourth session in 2022. With the support of the Secretariat and implementing partners, I hope that this APIS action plan evolves into a regional blueprint for closing the digital divide by enabling us to work together on accelerating digital connectivity. Third, on science, technology, and innovation. The committee emphasized the importance of putting inclusivity and sustainability at the heart of science, technology, and innovation policies and strongly supported the Secretary's work on this agenda. In this regard, the committee recommended that the Secretary continue to support member states to develop inclusive technology and innovation policies for sustainable development. The committee recognized innovative business models and practices as important sources of innovation and recommended that the Secretariat continue to build the evidence base of effective policies and facilitate knowledge sharing among policymakers in the Asia Pacific region. Fourth, on capacity development support, the committee recommended that the Secretariat continues to facilitate knowledge sharing and provide demand driven capacity building support on effective ICT policies and science, technology, and innovation strategies to respond to COVID-19 and sustainable development through the work of the Asian and Pacific Training Center for Information and Communication Technology for Development, APCICT, and the Asian and Pacific Center for Transfer of Technology, or APCTT. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Taking this opportunity on behalf of member states, the third session of the committee, I would like to express deep appreciation to the ESCAP Secretariat for this arrangement. Thank you. May I now invite the chair of the 15th session of the Governing Council of the Asian and Pacific Training Center for Information and Communication Technology for Development, Mr. Sung Joon Choi, Director, Multilateral Cooperation Division, Ministry of Science and ICT of the Republic of Korea to deliver his statement. Mr. Choi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Excellencies, Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Governing Council of the Asian and Pacific Training Center for ICT for Development, I am pleased to brief you on the outcome of the Council's del deliberations during its 15th session held virtually on 26 November 2020. Taking place during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the 15th Governing Council session reviewed the implementation of the center's work program as well as its administration and financial status. These include the center's efforts to enhance its capacity development support to member states in the areas of digital government and digital transformation, ICT for disaster risk management, data driven governance data privacy legislation, and cross-sector infrastructure sharing for broadband connectivity in Asia and the Pacific. The Governing Council endorsed the Center's medium-term strategy 2021 to 2023, which will enable the Center to provide more impactful capacity building programs, expand its footprint in the region, and deepen support to member states. The strategy also aims to enhance support to member states to build back better from the COVID-19 pandemic through leveraging digital technologies and providing advisory service support and technical assistance. The Governing Council also reviewed and endorsed the recommendations of the independent evaluation of the center that was conducted in 2019. Among these recommendations are conducting a comprehensive ICT needs assessment of member states and aligning the center's objectives and vision with the digital era, 
establishing an advisory group of experts, strengthening resource mobilization, and encouraging the participation of under, underrepresented subregions and least developed countries in future council sessions. On behalf of the council, I take this opportunity to invite all ASCOP member states to collaborate and support the important work of the center, including through voluntary and in-kind contributions. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, as you may know, the three-year term of the current council membership is set to expire this year. In view of the COVID-19 pandemic, which makes it difficult to conduct the election of a new body by secret ballot as provided for in Rule 41 of the Commission's rule, Rules of Procedure. The Governing Council recommends that the Commission consider extending the term of the current members of the Council by one year on an exceptional basis and holding the next, next election at its 78th session in 2022. Thank you, Chair. Next, may I invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the 16th session of the Governing Council of the Asian and Pacific Centre for Transfer of Technology, Mr. Lin Hao Chen, Deputy Director General, Department of International Cooperation, Ministry of Science and Technology, People's Republic of China. Distinguished chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and pleasure for me to brief the outcomes of the 16th session of the Governing Council for, of the APCTT. The 16th session was held in virtual mode on 2nd and 3rd December 2020 and hosted by the Ministry of Science and Technology of the People's Republic of China. It was attended by all 11 GC member states as well as observers. With reference to the substantive work of the center, the council satisfied and expressed appreciations to the excellent results and outcomes achieved by the center. Despite major challenges imposed by COVID-19 pandemic, the center delivered and contributed to the seven demand-driven capacity building events in collaboration with 27 partner institutions, the center's capacity building activities enhanced knowledge and skills of 720 policymakers and participants. As a decision, the council requested APCTT to continue providing highly useful demand-driven capacity activities on the areas such as identification, transfer, adaptation, and adoption of technologies. The Council adopted the proposed program of work of the Center for 2021. It requested the Center to consider the proposal presented by Council members as well as other organizations during the session. The Council also requested the Center to organize annual international conference at the occasion of the Governing Council session. With reference to the review of administrative and financial status of the Centre, the Council expressed appreciation to the Government of India for its decision to increase its annual voluntary financial contributions for institutional support to the Centre. In addition, the Council invited Member States to consider the following to provide voluntary financial contributions to the center at the level recommended in the report of independent external evaluators prepared in 2018, to finance new technical cooperation projects, or to provide in-kind support to the center. To contribute national experts to work at the center on a non-reimbursable loan basis. As for the venue of the 17th session of the Governing Council session, 
the Council welcomes with appreciation the offer made by the Government of India to host it around November or December in 2021. Thank you. Next, may I invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the seventh session of the Committee on Statistics, Mr. Gogita Toradzi, Executive Director, National Statistics Office of Georgia. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, national statistical systems in Asia and the Pacific have an ambitious agenda to produce, deliver and communicate in the vast array of official statistics. These statistics should be relevant, trusted, and meet the needs of many users. In 2017, the Commission endorsed the report of the Fifth Committee on Statistics containing our collective vision that by 2030, national statistical systems are enabled and empowered to lead development and deliver innovative, trusted, and timely products and services for urgently needed and evolving statistical requirements of Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. And in 2019, the Commission endorsed a declaration entitled Navigating Policy with Data to Leave No One Behind. The declaration acknowledges hollow government support to national statistical systems to ensure data and statistics are available for all population groups, including women, migrants, and the disabled, and at the local level. Georgia was elected as a chair of the Bureau of the Committee on Statistics at its seventh session in 2020. I would like to thank my colleagues for this honor. Under difficult circumstances brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, I chaired the committee's formal session in August 2020 and wish to acknowledge the support given to me by all countries, development partners, and the secretariat. Despite the challenges of the hybrid modality, the committee made five important decisions. The committee endorsed a monitoring and evaluation framework for the collective vision and declaration, and a final framework will be circulated to the countries by the end of 2021. The committee decided to actively pursue several areas to address data gaps, including the mainstreaming of gender into its activities. The committee also agreed to focus attention on the use of big data for official statistics and the integration of data into uh, consistent and coherent accounts and agreed statistical capacity building and training, including through the Statistical Institute for Asia and Pacific, should be also priority. These decisions are timely given and uh, recent launch of the 2021 Asia Pacific SDG Progress Report. The report highlights data availability for the SDGs has improved from 27% in 2017 to nearly 50% in 2020. It also uses disaggregated data for 27 global indicators. However, despite a lot of progress, over recent years, data gaps remain. Six years into the 2030 agenda and still 39 indicators have no data for any countries in our region and disaggregated data for key population groups, including women and the desired, are missing. This highlights the important 
role of the national statistical systems and the Commission's Committee on Statistics. We still have work to do. The Bureau, we are requested to draft recommendations for implementation of these four decisions for the consideration of the committee while bearing in mind uh, the need of, um, the need to stay within existing regular budgets. The Bureau's draft recommendations have been circulated to committee members. Ladies and gentlemen, while we have much to do, we are on the right path. And this year, a second ministerial conference on civil registration and vital statistics will take place to hear the progress towards the region agreed vision for universal registration and areas in need of acceleration. I invite you all to participate in the ministerial to ensure we get everyone everywhere in the picture. I take the opportunity to thank you and our development partners for your commitment to data and statistics. The committee's work would not be possible without the significant contribution of donors, in particular from the government of Australia, China, Japan, Republic of Korea, the Russian Federation and the United Kingdom, as well as Bloomberg Philanthropist Data for Health Initiative. We are delivering on the data needs for the 2030 Agenda and we are delivering together. Your support and encouragement is invaluable to our efforts. Thank you. May I now invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the 16th session of the Governing Council of the Statistical Institute for Asia and the Pacific, Ms. Hata Chanok Chinalpawat, Director of the Statistical Forecasting Division, National Statistical Office of Thailand. On behalf of the Governor Council of the Statistical Institute for Asia and the Pacific, I would like to report the outcome of the 16th session of the Governor Council. The 16th session of the Governor Council of the Statistical Institute for Asia and the Pacific was held on 30 November and 1st December 2020 via video conferencing. During the session, the Council considered the report of the Director at its achievements in 2020. Council members also expressed their view on a draft resource mobilization strategy and advise next steps for the development of the strategy. The Council further considered the Institute's proposed work program and financial plan for 2021. Even under the COVID-19 pandemic, training needs were strong. The Institute organized and delivered virtual interactive training course the number of participants were 2,709 in 2020, almost the burn of that in 2019. Delivery of e-learning course were supported by a couple of webinars. The Council acknowledged the achievements of the Institute during the pandemic condition. The Council reviewed a draft resource mobilization strategy which aims to improve the quality and increase the quantity and diversity of the institute resource base. The Council welcomed the focus on partnership and supported the importance of partnerships with the private sector, especially regarding new technologies, new technical skills and access to, to new data source. The Council asked for the draft strategy is to be further developed with greater detail and for it to be considered by the Council in its next section in 2021. The Institute proposed 37 training courses, including 14 e-learning courses, and a webinar as the work program and financial plan for 2021. The Council reviewed and endorsed 
the work program and financial plan, except for the hiring of consultation for implementation of the resource mobilization strategy, since the strategy would be further considered in its next section. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to present the outcome of the 16th session of the Governor Council of the, the Institute to the Commission today. Thank you. May I now invite the Vice Chair of the 6th Session of the Committee on Social Development, Ms. Zilla Binti Mohamed Sidek, Minister and Permanent Representative of Malaysia to ESCAP, to deliver her statement. Ms. Sidek, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to report the outcomes of the Committee on Social Development as Vice Chair of the Committee Session on behalf of the Chair, Her Excellency Mrs. Samantha K. Jayasuria, former Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the Government of Sri Lanka and Permanent Representative to ESCAP. Social protection is a powerful tool to reduce poverty and inequalities and build resilience to shocks and crises over the life cycle. A year on from the outbreak of the global pandemic, Social protection has proven indispensable in country responses to buffer its economic, its social economic fallout. The crisis has compelled us to see how neglect of the vulnerable puts the stability and well-being of society at large in jeopardy. The need for comprehensive and inclusive social protection has become ever more pressing. ASCAP member states have recognized the critical role of social protection to foster more inclusive, resilient, and prosperous societies. In 2018, the fifth session of Committee on Social Development recommended the Secretariat to explore and develop a modality for regional cooperation in this area. Subsequent to this, a draft action plan was developed in, in consultation with member states and endorsed on 21st October 2020 at the sixth session of the Committee on Social Development. Voluntary in nature, the action plan provides the region with a standard, with a shared vision, strategy and platform for promoting partnership, knowledge and peer learning, as well as needs for technical assistance. Its endorsement represents the importance of mem the importance member states place in social protection as a key policy tool to ensure that all people in the region have access to an adequate standard of living, basic income, and equal opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, high quality, accessible, timely, and reliable disaggregated data are needed to, to measure the progress of development and ensure that no one is left behind. This important fact was recognized in the program of action of the International Conference on Population and Development, the, Asia, the Asian and Pacific Ministerial Declaration on Population and Development, and the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. In line with the above, the committee also endorsed the Asia-Pacific Indicator Framework for voluntary monitoring of progress in implementing the Program of Action of the International Conference on Population and Development and of the commitments contained in the Asian and Pacific Ministerial Declaration on Population and Development. The framework focuses on key priority areas, actions, sorry, of the Ministerial Declaration and aligns them with the related goals and targets of the 2030 Agenda, thereby helping Member States to avoid duplicate data collection efforts. Using the framework and its indicators, will help member states perform voluntary regular monitoring and evaluation of progress towards the program of action, the ministerial declaration and the 2030 agenda. It will therefore contribute to member states' efforts to use data and information for evidence-based policy making. As chair of the sixth session of the Committee on Social Development, I'm pleased to note that the action plan and the indicator framework the outcomes of the session focus on concrete actions to guide the UN Decade of Action. The committee's endorsement of the action plan and indicator framework 
underscore member states' ambitions to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development by ensuring that no one is left behind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next, may I invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the Asia Pacific Regional Review of Implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. Her Excellency, Ms. Sarah Lou Ariola, Under Secretary for Migrant Workers Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. As the chair of the Asia Pacific Review of the GCM, held from March 10 to 12, 2021, I have the honor to highlight key messages and recommendations of the meeting as contained in document SCAP 77 27. At the meeting, countries in Asia and the Pacific reiterated their commitment toward the implementation of the GCM and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Participants recognize the significant scale complexity and impact of migration in the region and beyond. They highlighted migrants' major contributions to sustainable development in countries of origin, transit, and destination. Asia and the Pacific has made much progress in advancing GCM implementation. For example, countries have developed and implemented national migration policies and action plans improve transparency certainty and simplification of migration procedures, and conducted skills training of migrant workers. Some countries have successfully advanced GCM implementation by whole of government and whole of society approach. However, much remains to be done. Distinguished delegates, first, in some countries of the region, safe and regular pathways for migration are still missing, and migrant workers in the informal sector including domestic workers, face many challenges. Decent work, fair and ethical recruitment, and greater skills development, as well as recognition of skills, qualifications, and competencies should be prioritized. Second, implementing migration policies requires international cooperation and compliance with international law. The rights of migrants and their families, regardless of status, have to be protected. Civil and birth registrations have to be facilitated and alternatives to detention implemented. Third, migrants should have equal access to basic services and migration policies should be gender sensitive and child sensitive. Migration costs should be reduced further and pre-departure, post-arrival and reintegration training could contribute to greater inclusion of migrants and social cohesion. Fourth, accurate, timely, and disaggregated data and information on migration was important to strengthen evidence-based policy making, public debate, and cooperation. National capacity on migration data should be built, in particular, by aligning the SDGs and GCM objectives. Lastly, COVID-19 has severely affected migrants and their families. Migrants, however, are part of recovery and building back better efforts, and nobody is safe until everyone is safe. Ladies and gentlemen, in the context of this year's Commission's theme, the call by member states, stakeholders, and international organizations at the Regional Review to step up international regional coordination and cooperation on international migration is especially relevant. Partnerships between governments at national and local levels United Nations organizations, including the Regional United Nations Network on Migration for Asia and the Pacific, and stakeholders who support the protection of migrants and their integration and contribution to development now and in the future. The meeting report, including the chair summary as well as the procession documents, will be submitted to the International Migration Review Forum in 2022. I look forward to working with member states. ESCAP and the Regional United Nations Network on Migration and ensuring that the outcome of the meeting is featured at the IMRL. Please allow me to thank you for the trust bestowed upon me to serve as chair of the GCM Asia Pacific Review and to submit this report for your consideration today. Thank you.
Next, may I invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the Committee on Transport, His Excellency, Mr. Bart Adini Jalavsuren, Vice Minister of Road and Transport Development of Mongolia. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to have assumed the chairmanship of the Committee on Transport, its sixth session on 12th and 13th November 2020, and to present its outcomes here at the 77th session of Commission, which is dedicated to such a topical and important tema for our region. The committee deliberated against the background of the COVID-19 crisis and in full awareness of the vital role of transport connectivity during major global disruptions. Regional cooperation on transport is an integral part of the region's response to the pandemic and any future efforts to make our region more resilient. Importantly, the committee recognized the present need to holistically incorporate sustainability in all its dimensions in the next phase of the Regional Action Program 2022-2026 that will be considered for adoption at the Fourth Ministerial Conference on Transport in late 2021. Against this background, the committee adopted six key recommendations addressing the cross-cutting impact of transport on society, the new challenges arising in line with the region's development agenda, and inevitable links to the issues of sustained economic development, environmental protection, climate change, resilience, and social inclusion. The committee recommended that initiatives on sustainable freight and transport connectivity for efficient and resilient supply chains be taken up within the scope of regional mechanisms, including in design of the draft of the next phase of the regional action program. The committee recommended the enhancement of efforts to future advanced regional and inter-regional transport connectivity, notably on the Asian Highway Network, the Trans-Asian Railway Network, maritime ports and networks and intermodal corridors in involving dry ports, with due consideration for, for the situation of the countries with special needs. The committee requested the Secretariat to explore in a cost-effective manner and possibility of including additional stakeholders from government. The private sector and scientific community, as well as from other regions and the discussions on Eurasian connectivity. The commit committee recommended that the Fourth Ministerial Conference on Transport include relevant environmental dimensions of transport systems and services in the draft of next phase of the regional action program, especially on issues such as limiting greenhouse gas emissions, improving energy efficiency, shifting freight and passenger transport to sustainable modes, smart transport systems and smart mobility, and promoting electric mobility and integrated urban transport planning. The committee recommended that the Fourth Ministerial Conference accord more comprehensive attention to the dimensions of accessibility and inclusion in design of the next phase of regional action program. The committee also considered the proposed priority areas for the next phase of the Regional Action Program 2022-2026 in the context of the Decade of Action for the Sustainable Development Goals 
and recognized and the need to accel accelerate progress. It does recommend that the next regional action program will maintain the traditional focus areas such as infrastructure and operational connectivity, road safety, urban transport and digitization of transport and will be designed around the three pillars. Transport connectivity for efficient and resilient supply chains. Environmentally sustainable transport systems and services. Safe and inclusive transport and mobility. On behalf of the committee, we welcome and count on the continued support of the Commission and of the Secretariat and the efforts towards sustainable transport systems in Asia and Pacific to support the achievement of the sustainable development goals. This concludes my intervention. Thank you, Chair. May I now invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the sixth session of the Committee on Environment and Development, Her Excellency Mrs. Suchitra Durai, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative of India to ESCAP. Thank you, Chair. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it has been an honor for me to serve as the chair of the sixth session of the Committee on Environment and Development, which was held in a hybrid mode on the 9th and 10th December 2020. I'm pleased to mention that Mr. Diki Komar of Indonesia and Mr. Oleg Shamano of the Russian Federation served as vice chairs. The committee reviewed the environmental challenges in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and discussed solutions to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 Agenda in Asia and the Pacific, including through regional cooperation. Let me express appreciation to the Secretariat for its analysis on the thematic priorities deliberated during the session, namely raising climate ambition, safeguarding ecosystem health, clean air for all, cities for a sustainable future. The committee noted the relationships between environment and development and especially between environmental health and human health. The importance of safeguarding environmental health to prevent zoonosis was highlighted. The committee acknowledged the impacts of climate change and the critical need to raise climate ambitions and welcome carbon neutrality targets for, from several nation, nations. It discussed policies such as decarbonization of sectors, renewable energy, emission trading and carbon pricing, and mainstreaming adaptation measures. Recognizing that the region had failed to meet any of the AG biodiversity targets, the committee discussed the importance of safeguarding ecosystems health to avoid the risk of zoonotic diseases. The committee also noted the opportunity to accelerate the application of ocean science in the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development and to address issues of plastic pollution, including through circular economy approaches. The committee highlighted the role of urban centers and local actions to support resilient recoveries. Information was shared with the committee on smart city developments, integrating climate resilience in urban planning and policy solutions to address high levels of air pollution. The International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies was highlighted as a new regional advocacy platform. The committee decided to establish a technical expert group to enhance regional exchange and mobilize expertise to accelerate environmental and sustainable development action. I'm uh, hopeful that the expert group can help the sub-program to continue building on the outcomes of the seventh ministerial conference on environment and development. I look forward to the endorsement of the recommendations and decisions of the sixth committee on environment and development by the 77th session of the commission. As chair, I would like to once again thank all the distinguished delegates who contributed to the robust discussions during the session. Thank you.
Next, may I invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the Governing Council of the Centre for Sustainable Agricultural Mechanisation, Dr T Tam Din, Vice Director General, Vietnam Institute of Agricultural Engineering and Post Harvest Technology. Respected chairs and distinguished delegates, I have the honor to address the Commission today in my capacity as a chair of the 16th session of the Governing Council of the Central for Sustainable Agricultural Mechanization, or CSAM. To brief you on the outcomes of the meeting, which was attended by representatives of all nine members of the Council. During its deliberation, the Governing Council took note of the serious impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on agricultural production, processing and sale, which have re resulted in a loss of employment and reduction in farmers' income. In this context, the Council recognized that the important role of the sustainable agricultural mechanization in enabling recovery and building resilience. It underscores the importance of promoting mechanization solutions to address smallholders' requirements and reduce post-harvest losses, enabling capacity building for producers and promoting smart farming, among other issues. The Governing Council was informed about the key recent results of CSAM work on sustainable agricultural mechanization, including enhancing relevant capacities and response of member states to COVID-19, enabling climate smart mechanization, providing expanded business opportunities for private sector, and selection of two CSAM's programs as good practice in South-South and Triangular cooperation. The Governing Council expressed appreciation for the work carried out by the Central during 2020, especially in view of the constraints posed by the pandemic. It also expressed support for CSAM's analytical work and its work towards generating relevant policy recommendations for member states. The Council endorsed the Central's work report and financial status report for 2020 and work plan for 2021. Among its recommendations, the Governing Council suggested that CSAM promote online knowledge exchange through webinars and online trainings. Spanish initiative for the harmonization of regional testing standards and continue to, to promote safety and mechanization for the benefit of member states. The Governing Council brings the following matter to the attention of the Commission. Given that the 77th session of Commission is being, being held as a hybrid in-person and online meeting, which makes it difficult to conduct voting via secret ballot for the election of the Governing Council for its next three-year term, 2021-2024, as provided for in Rule 41 of the Rules of Procedures of the Commission, the Council recommends that the con Commission consider extending on an exceptional basis the terms of current members of the Councils by one year and hold the next elections as the 78th session of the Commission in 2022. In conclusion, I would like to underscore that CSAM is entirely funded through the extra budgetary resources of ESCO. I thank the Central's hot country, China, as well as other countries for their valuable financial contributions and in-kind support. I urge all ASCAP members and associate members to continue to support the important work of CSAM. Thank you for the attention. May I now invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the seventh session of the Committee on Trade and Investment, His Excellency Mr. Vangelis Vitalis, Deputy Secretary, Trade and Economic, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of New Zealand. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it was a real privilege together with uh, my fellow uh, vice chairs from Mongolia and Indonesia to be elected then as chair of the seventh session of the Committee on Trade and Investment, which of course, as you will recall, was convened from the 27th to the 29th of January uh, earlier this year, unfortunately in a virtual format. The committee was of course attended by representatives from all 45 member states and associate member states, seven United Nations bodies, officers and specialised agencies, three international organisations and one non-governmental organisation, 
also attended and I was very pleased to welcome them all. I'm really pleased to summarise uh, for you the following key outcomes and there were five. First, the committee reaffirmed its commitment to multilateralism, the rules-based trading system, regional cooperation in trade and investment in order to guarantee the steady flow of goods at national border crossing points. In this context, it recommended that the Secretariat continue its activities in trade and investment and enterprise development with a view to achieving the sustainable development goals that we all um, are committed to. The committee also recommended the inclusion in future work in future of regional trade and cooperation agreements of provisions that limit disruption to trade, investment and of course the associated global value chains that are so critical to us in this time of pandemic as well as other crises in addition to provisions that can also support our shared commitment to sustainability and sustainable development more generally. The second set of outcomes is we recognise the importance of the digital economy. The committee requested the Secretariat to deepen its analysis of existing conventional e-commerce and digital trade rules and regulations with a view to promoting and supporting harmonisation and identifying international best practices. This is critical work. In this context, the committee also requested the Secretariat to provide support to our smaller uh, member economies and least developed countries. The committee further recommended that existing standards and initiatives, including the Framework Agreement on Facilitation of Cross-Border Paperless Trade in Asia and the Pacific, be leveraged to the greatest extent possible. And I do think that is really important work. The committee also expressed its support to the Secretariat's online, very valuable resource, the Trade Intelligence and Negotiation Advisor. And I do warmly commend that piece of, uh, that instrument to you. The third area that we focused on and where we want to bring to your attention is that the committee recommended that increased attention by all of us be paid to the important role of both inward and outward FDI in promoting sustainable development and that countries must promote transparent investment regimes to fully leverage these benefits. In this context, the committee supported the Secretariat's initiative to explore the development of an online platform that helps our member states and our colleagues match inward and outward investment and templates for developing indicators that can measure the sustainability of investment flows. Fourth, in recognising the important role of the business sector, the committee recommended that the Secretariat continue its activities in helping small and medium-sized enterprise, which are so critical, of course, to all of our economies, in particular those managed by women, and to engage the business sector more directly in achieving the sustainable development goals, again, to which we are all committed through our existing modalities. And this, of course, includes the ESCAP Sustainable Business Network and the Asia Pacific Business Forum. Finally, colleagues, the committee also requested the Secretariat to organise within existing resources, <laughs> that'll be fun, uh, regional consultations on trade and investment for the specific purpose of helping the LDCs, our least developed colleagues, countries, to cope with and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and in support of their graduation from least developed country status especially in the context of their engagement in the World Trade Organization. And I do think that is a critically important role for us as a committee. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a real privilege. Let me take this opportunity on behalf of all member states at the seventh session of the committee. I would like to express my deep appreciation uh, to the ESCAP Secretariat for their great work and for the arrangements that have been made to make this meeting successful. I do wish you all the very best. Thank you again. May I now invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the third session of the Committee on Energy, His Excellency Mr. Joan Uzamati, Minister for Infrastructure and Meteorological Services of Fiji. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It was an honour for me to chair the third session of the Committee on Energy, together with the ambassadors of Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Nepal, and the Deputy Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Energy, Thailand, as Vice Chairs. The committee was attended by 40 members and associate members, one permanent observer, UN agencies, seven international organisations, and seven NGOs. I am pleased to summarise the outcome of the sessions as follows. First, the committee reaffirmed the need for energy transition for the region for sustainable development in recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic through regional cooperation. 
The committee recommended the Secretariat to integrate energy security and resilience into its activities at the regional, sub-regional and national levels. Second, the committee recognized that the region is still far from achieving the vision of SDG 7 and invited its members to accelerate the pace of progress towards Sustainable Development Goal 7 and further promote sharing of experiences and lessons learned through regional cooperation in order to effectively contribute to the achievement of Goal 7. Third, the committee recommended the agenda of the third meeting of the Asian and Pacific Energy Forum to be developed in consultation with member states. It further recommended that the background documents be developed with advice from the expert working groups on energy, connectivity and on universal access to modern energy services, renewable energy, energy efficiency and cleaner use of fossil fuels. Fourth, the committee recognized the need to strengthen national capacity on sustainable energy including development of strategies for clean cooking and for municipal level implementation and requested the Secretary to support Member States in these efforts. Finally, the Committee requested the Secretary to facilitate efforts of Member States in further defining and strengthening energy connectivity in the Pacific to attain Sustainable Development Goal 7. I am pleased to also inform Members of the Commission that the Committee also made the following decisions for the attention of the Commission. First, the committee commended the work delivered by the expert working group on energy connectivity and endorsed the regional roadmap on power system connectivity, promoting cross-border electricity connectivity for sustainable development. The committee decided that the expert working group would continue to provide advice to the Secretariat on the implementation of the regional roadmap. Second, the committee endorsed the terms of reference of the expert working groups on energy connectivity and on universal access to modern energy services, renewable energy, energy efficiency and cleaner use of fossil fuels with amendments. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank Member States for their contribution made towards the outcome of the session. I commend all Member States' efforts and contributions towards attaining the 2030 Agenda for sustainable development including Goal 7. With those few words, I wish the Forum a successful deliberation. Finally, may I invite the conference room officer to play the video of the chair of the fifth session of the Governing Council of the Asian and Pacific Centre for Disaster Information Management, Dr. Syed Hamid Pumahamadi, Deputy Head of the Plan and Budget Organization, Islamic Republic of Iran. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and privilege to have assumed the chairmanship of the Governing Council of the Asia and Pacific Center for the De Development of Disaster Information Management at its fifth session on 26 January 2021 and to present its outcomes here at the 77th session of Commission. The Council noted the challenges caused by COVID-19 and made recommendations on the ways and means through which Actin could expand its contribution on capacity development and promote regional cooperation and partnership on disaster knowledge and information management in the region. The Council stressed the importance of disaster risk reduction and information management to enhance connectivity, disaster and climate resilience and risk informed development in the region. In order to achieve the objectives of Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and Sustainable Development Goals, the Council reviewed and discussed the report on activities of our teams since the fourth session of the Governing Council and noted with 
the satisfaction and implementation of our team work plan 2020, which was adopted by the Council's fourth session in Islamabad on 20 February 2021 with 83% implementation rate. Within the above context, the Council made the following decisions. The Governing Council of Aptim has taken note of the report on the activities of Aptim since the fourth session of the Council and, ex and expressed uh, its satisfaction with the progress and achievements made in the implementation of the program of work of the Center. The B. The Council has taken note of the administrative and financial status of the Center and the, the completion of the progress for its establishment, including financial ratification of host country agreement and conclusion of the administrative and financial agreement of the Center. The Council encouraged the members and associate members of SCAP to mobilize financial and or in-kind support for the Center and take active role in the delivery of the Center's program of work. The Council endorsed the month-year strategic program of work and the program of Biennium 2021-2022 of the Center. The Council expressed its deep appreciation to the Government of the Islamic Republic of Iran for hosting the Center and providing generous financial and in-kind contribution for the establishment of act and activities of the Center. The Council also thanked the government of Cambodia and Macau, China for providing financial contributions to ACTI. The Council endorsed with appreciation the offer not made by the government of Turkey to host the sixth session of the Council. The Council ex uh, extended its gratitude to the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran for hosting its fifth session. Thank you. At this, at this point, let us proceed to agenda item 4A, Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. The report of the forum is contained in document SCAP 8 For your information, colleagues from the Secretariat are standing by to respond to any queries or requests for more information. I now open the floor for comments. I would urge all speakers to adhere to the time limit of two minutes. The first speaker is the distinguished delegate from Bangladesh to be followed by Korea. Bangladesh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Bangladesh is strongly committed to the core values of SDGs leaving no one behind, and as such, it maintains a whole-of-society approach in all its development interventions. The country has adopted coherent policies and, inter and institutional approaches and the strategies to achieve the Agenda 2030. Government has given goal-wise coordinating responsibilities to 17 ministries for 17 goals, and also estimated financing needs for SDGs implementation, and designed SDG tracker to monitor the progress. Two VNRs have been submitted in 20, 2017 and 2020, engaging all stakeholders. In the next VNR, we expect to start the process from the sub-districts level. Ladies and gentlemen, 
overcome the potential adverse effects of COVID-19, the government has adopted a series of economic stimulus packages for recovering the economy into its original trajectory and successful implementation of the SDGs. The COVID-19 pandemic poses enormous challenges, but it also aware us more than ever about the importance of collective efforts and cooperation to recover from the crisis and towards the realization of the Agenda 2030. There is also scope for the Asia Pacific Regional Development Fund to expand and to provide a new framework for regional cooperation in financing sustainable development priorities through its infrastructure and social windows. International development cooperation also has a role to play in helping the countries meet their development financing needs. We firmly believe that together we can overcome the challenges and able to build a sustainable world. Thank you very much. The next speaker is the distinguished delegate of the Republic of Korea to be followed by Thailand. Republic of Korea, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to begin my, by congratulating you on your election as, uh, chair, as chairman earlier today. I am confident that under your able guidance, the session will yield successful outcomes. Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed our world, slowing down the regional progress toward the 2030 agenda and the sustainable development goals. The crisis has highlighted the vulnerability and the system, systematic weakness of our societies and also the need for greater regional cooperation to address these challenges. As ASCAP's flagship publication, Asia and the Pacific SDG Progress Report 2021 acknowledges uh, the Asia Pacific region has shown positive developments on certain SDG goals over the years. However, the overall progress on the SDG still remain, remains uneven. And with the spread of the pandemic, our hard won development gains made in, this, in the past decades are at risk of being rolled back. In view, of, in view of this, the government of Republic of Korea is continuing its efforts to incorporate SDGs into national policy frameworks and further help uh, developing countries to successfully implement the SDGs in a more inclusive and resilient way. Domestically, the Korean government drafted the fourth basic plan for sustainable development 2021 to 2040, which is the basic platform for integrated policy to uh, policy action on relevant and urgent issues for the next five years, including the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate change. On the other hand, Korea adopted the mid-term strategy for development cooperation 2021 to 2025 that sets out strategic uh, directions, principles, as well as ODA targets based on the five P's shaping the SDGs. And working in close co collaboration with the ESCOP and other international organizations, we are sharing our development experience and ex expertise in this uh, high <clears throat> in, in high demand area such as ICT, education, energy, and health with partner countries in the Asia Pacific region. In this connection, the, the eighth Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development under the theme of sustainable and resilient recovery from the the COVID-19 pandemic provided a timely opportunity for member states to share 
their perspectives on the implementation, follow-ups, and review of the 2030 agenda at a critical time when the, the region is facing major setbacks in reaching the SDGs. As our delegation emphasized in the statement of the AFSC, the Korean government strongly believes that broader in investment in public health system, strengthened response to climate change and much faster partnership are the key to accelerate a stage of progress in the COVID-19 crisis. All right, Kay, please conclude your statement. In this context, we hope the, the newly uh, launched initiative, ODA Korea uh, Building Trust, with the aim to support countries in COVID-19 responses and sustainable development could also contribute to the Asia Pacific region's achievement of the SDGs. Mr. Chairman, the Republic of Korea remains committed to implementing the 2030 agenda and looks forward to the continuing our successful cooperation with ASCAP and other member states on the process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Republic of Korea, for your statement. The next speaker uh, is the distinguished delegate of Thailand to be followed by China. Thailand, you have the floor. I value the forum as a forum to take stock of the effect of COVID-19 and to discuss way forward on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the SDGs. At this year forum, Thailand emphasized that rapid socioeconomic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis must not mean a return to business as usual, which will exacerbate inequalities. I wish to simply echo what the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Thailand set out in his remark, three key issues that were crucial to recovery effort, namely the need to avoid business as usual, but to prioritize instead transformative models, including new development approach. Second, the need to close the digital divide and ensure digital literacy for all. And third, the need to preserve environmental gains during this pandemic and promote growth that is more balanced between value creation and environmental conservation. During the forum, Thailand organized two side events. The first event entitled Transformative Models to Build Back Better, Thailand's approach to a resilient, inclusive, and sustainable COVID recovery highlighted the importance of locally driven development approach, such as sufficiency economy philosophy, or you, as you know, as, a, as the SEP in driving forward SDG attainment during these challenging times. Panelists at this site event provided useful example and insight, such as the introduction of bio, circular, and green economy model as Thailand new model for balance and sustainable growth and the case study of the Yokohama city in Japan in localizing SDGs and realizing carbon neutrality Mr. Chair, Thailand also appreciates that the forum serves as a platform for multi-stakeholders to take part and exchange their experience at the regional level. At the second site event titled Volunteering as a Transformative Strategy for the Decade of Action, which we co-organized with the UN volunteers and the Ministry of Information and Social Development of Kazakhstan, the great contribution of volunteers to the achievement of the SDGs was highlighted. In this regard, we urge that the outcomes of all the discussion at the forum be further reflected at the high-level political forum on sustainable development this July. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Thailand, for your statement. 
Can I please ask uh, all delegates only to uh, request to speak uh, under uh, agenda item 4A, Asia Pacific uh, Forum, on, Forum on Sustainable Development. Um, if you wish to speak under that particular item, if you if you are speaking under, under a different topic and a different item, uh, please cancel your request to speak and uh, resubmit that request under the relevant item. The next speaker uh, on my list is uh, the, the distinguished delegate of China, uh, who will be followed by India. China, you have the floor. Xuxian 践行创新协调绿色开放共享的发展理念推动共建人与自然生命共同体作为全球最大的发展中国家中国将立足新发展阶段积极构建新发展格局促进社会公平增进民生福祉面对疫情挑战中国政府与人民协力同心艰苦努力有效控制疫情并实现了 为亚太乃至全球经济复苏和可持续发展注入动力。中方愿同ASCAP各成员加强合作，充分发挥亚太可持续发展论坛等政策交流平台作用，分享发展经验和良好实践，共同促进本地区可持续发展和疫后重建。
cash transfers, especially to the vulnerable sections. Special initiatives were implemented for migrant workers and frontline health workers. Customized interventions have been rolled out for women and children. Special emphasis has been laid on health and education. In order to reboot the economy, sector-specific initiatives and reforms have been implemented in agriculture, animal husbandry, fisheries, manufacturing and industries and other sectors. The Government of India has rolled out a host of measures under the Atm Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan or the Self-Reliant India Campaign and other schemes with the aim of strengthening India's competitiveness on the global stage and to help empower the, people, empower the poor, laborers, migrants and others who have been adversely affected. The central government and the Reserve Bank of India have provided significant fiscal and economic stimulus packages amounting to around 13% of India's GDP. Mr. Chair, the national response to the COVID-19 crisis has been marked by collaboration and partnership with all concerned stakeholders, including the civil society organizations, private sector and international development organizations. Around 92,000 civil society organizations and NGOs partnered with the government and contributed in managing the crisis. Industry sector networks joined the effort, brought the resources, matched problems with solutions, facilitated innovations and wrapped up domestic production capabilities for essential goods and equipment like ventilators and others. International organizations such as WHO, UNICEF, UNDP and other UN agencies to extended their support. Despite our constraints, we have also supplied vaccines to around 90 countries under Vaccine Maitri or the Friendship Program. Mr. Chair, we believe the pandemic and its devastating impact on the global economy can be combated through partnership and collaboration with other countries in the region and outside. As a region, we have to strive for growth which is inclusive and sustainable, and India will continue to bolster efforts in this regard. I thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, India, for your statement. I had announced uh, Indonesia as the next speaker, but uh, we have confirmed that Indonesia will not be speaking under this item. So uh, in that case, the next speaker is a distinguished, a distinguished delegate from Japan. Uh, Japan, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. It is imperative for the international community to undertake a societal transformation to achieve the sustainable development goals. To accelerate this process, Japan formulated its SDG Action Plan 2021 last December. Based on the plan, Japan, with the concept of no one is left behind, will promote multilateralism through our undertakings for realizing a green society and assessing develop, assisting developing countries in the area of health care by supporting vaccine immunization programs and universal health coverage. Chair, regarding the green society, I would like to share Japan's latest action plan on climate change. Japanese Prime Minister Suga Yoshihide at the Leader Summit on Climate, hosted by the United States on April 22nd and 23rd, declared that Japan aims to reduce its greenhouse gas emission in fiscal year 2030 by 46% from its fiscal year 2013 level, setting an ambitious target consistent with the long-term goal of net zero by 2050. Furthermore, he stressed that Japan will continue its strenuous effort in the challenge to meet the lofty goal of cutting its emission by 50%. Japan has been acti actively working for a global transition to decarbonization. On March 17th and 18th, Japan hosted the Zero Carbon City International Forum in cooperation with UNFCCC Secretariat and discussed ways to expand the circle of decarbonization and subsequently realize the so-called decarbonization domino effect. 
In SCAP, the government of Japan, in cooperation with SCAP Secretariat, France and UNEP, organized a side event titled Carbon Neutrality, the Future of Asia Pacific at the APFSD on March 23rd. And we are grateful for the participation of SCAP Executive Secretary, Madame Ali Shabana, and her opening remark. Mr. Chair, Japan, following our international commitment announced by Prime Minister Suga, and in close cooperation with SCAP, will contribute to the transition to decarbonization in the Asia Pacific and throughout the world. I thank you. Thank you, Japan, for your statement. Would any other delegation like to raise any other matters under this agenda item? I see none. I see no further requests to, to speak from member states. May I now invite statements from international organisations? I have on my list the representative of the United Nations Environment Program who has prepared a pre-recorded statement. May I invite the conference room officer to play the video. It's my pleasure to deliver these remarks on behalf of the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN and the UN Environment Program. As you know, the UN General Assembly has designated the years 2021 through 2030 as the Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. It's tasked UNEP and FAO to lead in its implementation. The goal of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration is to prevent, stop, and reverse the continued degradation of loss of the ecosystems. And this cuts across all ecosystems, from forests to farmland, from peaks of mountains to the depths of the sea. Research tells us that the next 10 years matter the most to prevent catastrophic climate change and bend the curve on biodiversity loss. During the next 10 years, every action, every day matters. Restoring ecosystems and reviving hundreds of millions of hectares is a daunting task, too big for any one organization to carry. The UN Decade will therefore create structures and systems allowing everyone, especially local communities, indigenous groups, the youth and women, to make meaningful contributions to restoration. I'm pleased to note that the UN Decade will be formally launched on World Environment Day on the 5th of June this year, hosted by the government of Pakistan. And in this regard, we look forward to the active participation of countries, joining hands, raising ambition, and scaling up flagship restoration initiatives being implemented in the region. We need all hands on deck, working together with urgency and determination for the goals of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Thank you. We shall now take up agenda item 4B, pertaining to the Committee on Information and Communications Technology, Science, Technology and Innovation. The documents pertinent to this item are SCAP 77 6 on summary of progress in the implementation of Commission resolutions, and resolutions 75 6, 75 7, and 75 8. SCAP 77 7 and the matters calling for action of the Commission or brought, to the, or brought to its attention of the Committee on Information and Communications Technology, Science, Technology and Innovation on its third session. SCAP 77 9 entitled Report of the Governing Council of the Asian and Pacific Training Centre for Information and Communication Technology for, de for development on its 15th session. SCAP 77 10 entitled Report of the Governing Council of the Asian and Pacific Centre for Transfer of Technology on its 16th session. SCAP 77 11 entitled Promoting Meaningful and Affordable Access to broadband internet for inclusive development. 
I now open the floor for comments. The first speaker uh, is the distinguished delegate of the Republic of Korea to be followed by Bangladesh. Republic of Korea, you have the floor. Improving ICT connectivity through the APIS can contribute to various aspects of social and economic activities in the Asia Pacific region. For example, by facilitating sustainable development and improving the quality of life. In particular, as the pandemic is highlighting the importance of ICT connectivity, implementing this initiative is critical to the integration and development of the Asia Pacific region. Korea endorses the Secretariat's implementation measures related to the Resolution 75-7. We look forward to seeing continued efforts for improving connectivity in the region through the APIS initiative and periodic reporting on the progress of the work. To continue the implementation of the APIS initiative, we expect all ASCA member countries work together in the drafting of the APIS Master Plan and Regional Cooperation Framework Document 2022 to 2026. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Republic of Korea, for your statement. The next speaker is the distinguished delegate of Bangladesh to be followed by China. Bangladesh, you have the floor. Mr. Chair, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good afternoon. Bangladesh is engaged to establish a reliable cyber access at the grassroots level, development of IT-based human resources, export-oriented development of IT industry, and the use of citizen-friendly IT technology. We have been working intensively in implementing SDGs related to ICTs in Bangladesh through our government agencies with active participation of local, private sectors, as well as foreign participation through FDI. All our initiatives and activities play a pivotal role to spread digital Bangladesh notion in all over the country. Moreover, it has significant effects in all areas, including government services, transport, energy, education, health, finance, and banking, productive industry sectors, trade and investment, and in other frontier technologies. The present government also working closely with Asia Pacific Information Superhighway initiatives to strengthen digital connectivity, reduce the digital divide, and support digital transformation in our country through enhancing availability and affordability of broadband internet networks and big data, which also helping us to achieve related SDGs. Substantial changes still need to be made in the public service delivery system through digitalization and incorporating innovation and simplification culture into the system. We think for all this, we need more international cooperation and collaboration to each other. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Bangladesh, for your statement. The next speaker is the distinguished delegate of China to be followed by Indonesia. China, you have the floor. Thank you, China. 
，亚太地区在该领域取得积极进展。我们应大力加强数字互联互通、智慧城市等科技创新领域区域合作，应加快落实亚太信息高速公路倡议，推进亚太国家数字基础设施建设，弥合数字鸿沟。应帮助发展中中成员推进经济社会数字化转型，实现共同进步。在此过程中，应加强合作，促进数字安全和网络安全，坚决反对利用互联网传播仇恨言论和污名化，促进社会团结和包容。近年来，中国大力实施创新驱动发展战略，加大人工智能、大数据。区块链等新技术研发投入和应用，推动建设数字中国。数字经济是中国科技创新重要发展方向。二零一九年，中国数字经济规模达三十五点八万亿元，占 GDP 比重达百分之三十六点二。中方愿同 ISGAP 成员加强合作，发挥通信技术和数字经济的独特作用。促进亚太可持续发展和疫后复苏。谢谢。Thank you, China, for your statement. The next speaker is the distinguished delegate of Indonesia. Indonesia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, distinguished delegates. Indonesia appreciates your tireless effort of Secretariat in advising science, technology, and innovation for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda in Asia and the Pacific. And we would like to inform the Committee on Indonesia plan to support this effort as follow. First, the government of Indonesia has planned to start operating a multifunctional satellite called Satellite Satria. Abbreviation from Satellite Republic Indonesia or the Satellite of the Republic of Indonesia in 2023. The satellite is expected to improve the quality of public internet services by increasing connectivity throughout the country, specifically in the underdeveloped frontier and other most region, as well as border areas. It is expected that through this project, our education, health, defense, and security administration and local government services will be connected with internet. Second, the government of Indonesia has also started to build telecommunication infrastructure. In example, this transfer station or BTS using 4G technology in 2,700 villages in the country. The development process takes two years and expected to finish within next year. On moving toward, on moving forward, Indonesia support to continue the sharing of the best practice and capacity building between member states on information and communication technology, science, technology, and innovation to strengthen the capacities of member states on using digital technologies for sustainable development. Indonesia stands ready to support the practice and promotion on expanding meaningful 
and affordable access to broadband internet and further accelerating digital transformation for sustainable development. Thank you for Chairman. Thank you, Indonesia, for your statement. Would any other delegation like to raise any other matter under this agenda item? I see none. We shall now take up agenda item 4C on the Committee on Statistics. The documents pertinent to this item are SCAP 77 6 Summary of Progress in the Implementation of Commission Resolutions and Resolution 74-8, SCAP-77-7, and the matters calling for action of the Commission or brought to its attention of the Committee on Statistics on its seventh session, SCAP-77-12, Report of the Governing Council of the, of the Statistical Institute for Asia and the Pacific on its 16th session, SCAP-77-13, is everyone in the picture, civil registration in the middle of the coronavirus disease pandemic? I now open the floor for comments. The first speaker is the distinguished delegate of Bangladesh to be followed by Russia. Bangladesh, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, thanks to the Secretariat for uh, the report, which is quite useful. Uh, Mr. Chair, Bangladesh has constituted the National Data Coordination Committee, or NDCC, for ensuring quality, reduced duplicity, and more streamlined data availability for better serving SDG and other international commitments. This is a manifestation of our evidence-based policy formulation and implementation. One of the prime usages in, is in conducting uh, population census. Over the years, the improvements were held in census undertakings. There is also a plan to conduct multimodal census this year. We had the plan to conduct the census in January. However, due to ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we hope to conduct the census in October of this year. Now, embedding advanced digital technology is also coming in handy during this pandemic time. Recently, a perception survey on livelihood 20 has been conducted using computer-assisted telephone interviewing. It collected remote data through mobile phones. Moreover, the government has also launched an online SDG progress tracker administered by the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics with backstopping IT support by the Access to Information program. In addition to the six basic data of the civil registration and vital statistics of the CRBS, you know the six basic like birth, death, cause of death, marriage, divorce, and adoption, in Bangladesh, we have added three more, which is migration in, migration out, and student enrollment. And now they are included, creating the CRVS and beyond, or CRVS plus. Through this system, an integrated service delivery platform will be developed that will include all government services, including social security. Therefore, under CRVS, a unique ID has been introduced to integrating the various ID systems available in the country and to specify each person separately. Finally, Mr. Chair, I would like to flag here that availability of sustained funding is a key requirement for ensuring reliable statistics. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Bangladesh, for your statement. The next speaker is the distinguished delegate of Russia to be followed by China. Uh, Russia, you have the floor. Господин председатель, уважаемые делегаты, Российская Федерация высоко ценит сотрудничество под эгидой ИСКАТА по повышению качества производимых в странах АТР официальной статистики. Без надежных статистических данных и их анализа невозможно представить себе качественный мониторинг выполнения в регионе цели устойчивого развития. Считаем необходимым в дальнейшей работе с КАТО на статистическом треке сделать особый акцент на решении задач по совершенствованию механизмов сбора, 
обработки, распространения и использования достоверных, актуальных и комплексных дезагрегированных статистических данных в странах-членах комиссии. Приветствуем итоги, прошедшей в августе 2020 года седьмой сессии Комитета по статистике. В этом контексте хотели бы особое внимание обратить на акцентированную в ходе работы Комитета актуальность обязательства партнеров по вопросам развития, закрепленного в декларации «Никто не будет забыт», учет данных при разработке политики 2018 года, более широко привлекать национальные статистические управления к сбору данных по ЦУР для повышения прозрачности и полноты статистической информации. С тем, чтобы такая информация выстраивалась прежде всего с опорой на официальные статистические органы страны СКАТА. Поддерживаем работу секретариата по укреплению партнерских связей с межнациональными статистическими службами стран АТР и кадрового потенциала стран-членов СКАТ в области статистики. Со своей стороны продолжаем оказывать последовательную финансовую и экспертную поддержку секретариату СКАТ в реализации проектов технического содействия, направленных на улучшение навыков стран Центральной Азии в области мониторинга достижения ЦУР, интеграции геопространственных и статистических данных и на повышение квалификации молодых сотрудников статистических служб. В этой связи хотели бы отметить важный экспертный вклад, который вносит сотрудничество на данном направлении Статистический институт для Азии и Тихого океана. Для содействия выполнению Институтом учебных программ Российская Федерация выделит 30 тысяч долларов США на бюджет СИАТО на 2021 год и средств российского добровольного взноса в бюджет СКАТО. Важным практическим вкладом России в увеличение практической отдачи от сотрудничества на статистическом треке и повышение профессионального уровня от корпуса экспертов стран АТР в области статистики является создание на базе Российской Федеральной службы государственной статистики Международного ресурсного центра для содействия укреплению потенциала в области производства и использования официальных статистических данных. Для разработки и выполнения его учебных программ будут привлекаться лучшие международные эксперты. Большинство курсов будут осуществляться на русском языке, но также будет предусмотрен перевод ряда из них на английский язык. Надеемся, что страны региона будут подключаться к работе в этой области. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you, Russia, for your statement. The next speaker is the distinguished delegate of China, to be followed by Thailand. China, you have the floor. China, we have a problem with your connection. We will move on to the next speaker and try to pick you up after that. Uh, in that case, uh, the next speaker is the distinguished delegate of Thailand. Uh, Thailand, you have the floor. On behalf of the representative of the National Statistical Office of Thailand, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the SCAT Secretariat for inviting me to be here with you this afternoon. Also, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude and appreciation to the Statistic Division of the UN SCAT and other relevant agencies for the technical assistance, facilitation, and Thai support for the statistical data for um, on practical guidelines for census survey and sample survey during COVID-19 pandemic held on 
8 April 2021. As we have realized, the theme of the annual meeting is Building Back Better from Crisis through Regional Cooperation in Asia and the Pacific, which aims to bring together government leaders from across Asia and the Pacific and other key stakeholders to discuss regional cooperation and greater connectivity in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and take stock of its socioeconomic impact. Thailand would like to share our leading practice on the development of the government data catalog. This project aims to improve the quality and efficiency of public service delivery. Also, it enables assistance in planning the data owned and produced by each government agency and supports the government data initiative and big data application. The National Statistical Office of Thailand, as the key agency for national statistical management, has initiated this project to support all government agencies in developing, developing their data catalog on the same standard. Recently, NSO has developed a protocol of the government data catalog system, the directory service system, and around 31 government agencies has been in the piloting process. This project consists of two main activities. The first is to promote and support government agencies in preparing their own internal data catalog to have the same standard classify the level of confidentiality and help identify information for metadata for every data set. This can be called agency data catalog. The second is to develop the same time platform for government data catalog and directory services to collect all lists of agency data catalog and register them to the government data catalog for sharing the benefits for the development of the government data catalog are data searching facilitation for many sources in a single platform and easily accessible for those listed as open data. To increase the trust of the data users, the catalog enables systematically integrates services and utilize information across departments. The value added from the integrated data will incur a positive result on more revenue generation and national competitiveness. The expansion of this result could reach a wider area when the agency starts sharing information for mutual use. For example, the need for the data to provide the COVID-19 pandemic solutions. Share. This meeting offer an enrichment opportunity to explain our statistical cooperation and a statistical dialogue to improve the quality of statistics in this region. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Thailand, for your statement. Uh, the next speaker on my list is the distinguished delegate of um, Indonesia. Following that, we will uh, endeavour to connect with China. Uh, Indonesia, you have the floor. Uh, Indonesia, can you please release the microphone? Okay, no, no, no. Yes, th thank you, Chair. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. With the fast-paced changes and ever-growing unprecedented challenges faced by the world because of the COVID-19 pandemic, Indonesia government is continuing the ongoing effort in minimizing the impact of the COVID pandemic through the implementation of the social safety net programs, which is part of the National Economic Recovery Program. The Ministry of Social Affairs plays a crucial role in distributing social assistance and providing data 
on social assistance recipients through the social welfare integrated data systems or, or what we call as DTIs. Investment in this sector is expected to produce valid, integrated, inclusive, disaggregated data on social welfare and development. Through the social protection program, it is hoped that public consumption and fulfillment of basic needs, especially for the poor and vulnerable, can be maintained during the pandemic. Assistance in the form of cash is also provided so that public consumption does not experience a significant decline. With the social welfare integrated data system, Indonesia believes there is a vital connection in, in statistics and data and in 2030, agenda for sustainable development, especially with regards to the principle of leaving no one behind. By this, Indonesia also believes it is our best interest to positively embrace these principles by bringing data and statistics to translate our commitment toward an inclusive and sustainable development for Asia, the Pacific, and the world. Thank you. Thank you, Indonesia, for your statement. Uh, the next speaker is the distinguished delegate of China. Uh, China, you have the floor. Uh, China, can you please try to refresh your browser and then request to speak again? Tongji 表示肯定。中国高度重视统计工作, 全球平台中国大数据区域中心将助力推进亚太区域统计能力建设中方还将继续依托中国ASGAP合作基金 应加强合作Thank you, China, for your statement. Uh, is there any other delegation who wishes to make any other comment under this agenda item? I see none. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, this brings us to the end of the allotted time for today. We will resume our discussions tomorrow, Thursday, 29 April, at 1000 hours Bangkok time sharp to take up agenda items 4D through 4J. Before we adjourn the meeting, may I call on the Secretary of the Commission to make an announcement. Thank you, Chair. Distinguished delegates, as mandated by the Commission, 
the Secretariat has been systematically assessing meetings under the conference structure to enable continuous improvement and facilitate the organization of future sessions. In this connection, we would like to announce that the link to the session's online evaluation questionnaire has been uploaded on the Commission web pages under the Overview tab and will be shared also on KUDO for the Distinguished Delegates' ease of reference. Your consolidated feedback over the past years has always been very valuable and has informed the preparations of future sessions. We thank you for taking the time to provide us with your most valuable feedback. I thank you. Thank you, Secretariat. The meeting is adjourned.